So let's ask God's blessing this morning on our time. Father, thank you again for the privilege of being able to gather together around your inerrant word. We thank you for preserving it down through many, many centuries, through much persecution, uh, much of the the uh, wiles of the devil, his, his cleverness in trying to uh, uh, disparage your word and, and make it of none effect. But Lord, we know we have the very word of God in our hands. And we thank you for it and the privilege of gathering without persecution here today. And uh, Lord, we just uh, pray that you'd prepare each of our hearts, including mine, to be fed from your word as we, as we read it this morning and digest it and apply it to our lives. We pray for Wilma. We just pray for the procedure, whether, whether it's going on or ongoing, uh, that it would go well with good results and that we might see her back uh, amongst our number uh, very soon. We just thank you for uh, our country that we live in, Father. It's not what it used to be. It's not what it's going to be. But we praise you for uh, providing us uh, the freedoms that we have today. We just pray, Father, that we do not take them for granted. And now uh, just uh, may we honor Christ in all that we say and do here this morning. And we ask all these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. So we see that uh, we're moving along. We... Uh, 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 we got to, he get, the Lord has, has told the disciples a number of things that are going to happen in the future that haven't, and some of which haven't even happened yet. And uh, so he, he's doing that and they, uh, they go over and they were on the Mount of Olives and some teaching was going on and then we get to chapter 14 and uh, it's, it takes off in a, in a new direction. And after two days was the feast of the Passover and the unleavened bread and the chief priest, I'm on page 232, and the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. So we see, you see where this is going and we see what's in the hearts of the religious uh, structure, uh, the, uh, the Jews' religion at that point in time. Uh, two days, uh, the two feast days of great importance to the Jews. Uh, the, it's the Passover, and it's uh, the uh, feast of of of, uh, of uh, breads. And so the chief priests uh, sought how they might get him. Uh, they first of all, there's a few things that are noteworthy. First, they would develop whatever reason they needed through deceit and treachery, for he was guilty. He was guilty of nothing. But they would, they would do all they could, whether, whether lying or cheating or false, they would do all they could to get him into a position where they could do away with him. Second, they needed it, they, and they wanted a permanent solution. They didn't want him put in prison. They didn't want him censured or fined or any of that. They wanted him dead. That's, and three, the, the Lord had, had a great following among the common people. And the religious leaders wanted it done with the least amount of blowback from them. So this was, this was going to be, the best of their ability, a secret assassination is what it was going to, or something to try to be done. In verse 3, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. So uh, the scene is now, he's in Bethany. This is a, a town to the east of Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem's on a hill. Then there's a little valley. Then there's another hill. Bethany's on this other hill to the east. I think Bethpage or Bethphage is, is another town close by that'll uh, show up in, in the text. And he's at the home of this man identified here as Simon the leper. I don't find in scripture any uh, text about the Lord healing a man by the name of Simon from his leprosy, but I have a feeling that that's exactly how Simon the leper lost his leprosy. I believe the Lord somehow cured him. And now, now the Lord and the disciples are visiting there. But he's identified as Simon the leper. I mean, so uh, I don't think his friends called him that. Now, as they sat at meat, 
meat in this text means at food. I mean, they're sitting down to some kind of a meal. It's not necessarily steak or ham or anything like that. It's, it's food in general. Uh, this also is the town where Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha live. So we know about the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead after he'd been dead a, a, a number of days. We know about that. And so Lazarus and Mary and Martha all live, they may have been neighbors. I mean, I don't think these cities were of huge size, but they may have been neighbors, maybe not. And there came a woman having an alabaster box. Uh, the word uh, is from the Greek, the alabastron, of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. So, I mean, I don't think she just doused him with it, but I think, you know, gently poured it on the, the Lord's head. Remember the Jews, uh, we, we need to think of how this gathering of, of food is going on here. They weren't sitting at some big round table with chairs, you know, uh, armchairs and stuff. They were sitting on the floor and they would have their legs, they would be sitting in such a way as, the, as their feet would be pointing away from the table. You wouldn't want all those feet sticking out there uh, with the food. So, and so, you know, you sit down like that in a circle and you got kind of on the sideways with the feet out the back. So they're sitting like that at, at food. Now in John's account, we have a name here. And, and there, there came a woman, John says, then, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spiked nard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odors of the ointment. I believe this is the same event. I can't be 100% sure, but I believe this is the same event. So we see that the woman's name is Mary. Alabaster, according to, uh, no, this alabaster box is a is a, according to Webster, is a compact, fine textured, usually white and translucent gypsum, often carved into vases and ornaments, a hard compact calcite or agonite that is translucent and sometimes banded. So it was kind of a, a stone type of, uh, of thing. I guess they either ground out the, the inside and you know made it to be some kind of a, a container. Uh, I don't think it was glass that they blew, you know, blew or anything. The text says she break it and poured it. So the idea is, the word for break does have the idea of shattering, but I don't think she would have shattered the thing. It would, you know, it would be all over the, and so I think uh, the idea here is, but if the container would, you know, shattered, it could hardly be used to pour anything. These containers were sealed, though, to preserve the context, and perhaps the seals were break to get the ointment out. So maybe the thing had a neck on it, where you break the top off, I mean, uh, even wine bottles and things like that, where I did that sometimes, you see people break the neck of the wine bottle off, and, and so. Verse four, so she does that. So this ointment is kind of all over the Lord. It's on his head and, and very easily getting down to his feet. And maybe she didn't pour it all, she, you know, so. Verse 4, and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. So there was, uh, so here we see now the question is, and there were some that had indignation. Now, maybe not all, but, but some. So how many, how many people were we talking about that were unhappy with what she did? Uh, in some uh, cases, even you know, even uninvited guests were witnesses at a meal. I mean, these these homes in those days were they didn't have these fancy doors. Sometimes the people would be in eating. There'd be people standing around outside talking to them through the door. Or you know, uh, we see it in different scriptures that was the case. There was people sitting, and there's religious leaders standing by, questioning the Lord, "Why are you doing this?" Whether so. You know, it, it was not a totally uh, isolated event, and so the uh, and so in any case, one objector was there was one objector. However, we don't know how many murmured, but we do that in one, in one case. We do know in the name of one. In John chapter twelve, verses four through six, then says one of his disciples, 
Oh, well, guess who? Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bore that which was therein. Now, if a pence and a penny are the, are, have the same meaning, uh, in our parable of the vineyard owner who sought men all day to work in the field and, and paid a penny, uh, which was a day's wage. Remember at the end of the day, uh, he paid everybody, whether they worked all day or just for an hour, he paid them one penny, which was a, day, a day's wage. The 300 pence then, <laughs> if, the, if, the, if the money is the same, then the 300 pence would be a year's wor wages. So that ointment was, a year's, was expensive, really expensive ointment. And that's why Judas was so, <laughs> oh, if I could only get my hands on that ointment, you know. And I wonder if he saw the bottle, you know, and knew what it was and saw it about to be, you know, oh, uh, three, you know. But he was the money man for them anyway. He was the, he was the money man for them, yes. But, you know, when they, when they distributed the money to the poor, they didn't get receipts. You know, there was no no uh, balance. Uh, no, there was no balance book. You know, being kept here. So we do not need to always give. You know, so that that was an expensive gift. So we just a few chapters or a chapter back, we talked about the weight of the woman that only had two pence. Or, or no, there was two mites. weren't even a pen, and she dropped them in. And the Lord was pointed out the importance of her, and and the and the beauty of her giving. And now we have somebody using something very, very expensive. Uh, perhaps the most expensive thing in the house. And they murmured against her. And uh, I believe this was Mary's best ointment. I, and they murmured against her. Not just Judas, but some, maybe all of them, of the disciples. Isn't it interesting that Judas would be made treasurer of this little group and that he would be, uh, he would be above suspicion until he reveals himself as the betrayer and leaves the company forever. The, the disciples had no clue that uh, the Judas was, was a thief. I mean, they had no clue to that. They, in, in, being the treasurer, they may have thought that the Lord had special trust in him. The Lord called him a devil. <laughs> the Lord knew exactly who he was. But the disciples were clueless with regard to it. So when Judas t took issue, so it would not be uncommon for the rest of the people to join in uh, money-wise because they were not rich by any means if materially. Verse 8, And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She had brought a good work on me. So the Lord now, uh, sometimes, sometimes we don't fully understand an action. You know, sometimes we, we just, we see something or we hear something but we may not have heard or seen it all, or, or we just don't necessarily fully understand it. That's the best time to keep our mouth shut if we don't fully understand something. Uh, this, is, this is a strong rebuke by the Lord here. You know, I, I suggest his tone was, leave her alone. You know, not something gentle. He's rebuking them. And look, this is at the end of their ministry. I mean... Three years. This is three years down the road. They're about ready to graduate, right? And they don't seem to know anything. And so she has wrought a good work on me. The dissenters could not have seen, uh, could not have been more wrong in the accusation. First of all, it was not their ointment. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that's, it was not their ointment. It was her ointment. And uh, second, they could have waited for the Lord's response, if any. I mean... You know, it was being poured on the Lord. They didn't focus at all on that. They were more concerned about the fact that they weren't going to get the money for it. And they were still very dull in their understanding of the times. Their, their thinking was still very dull. And so uh, the Lord then takes the opportunity to instruct the disciples. The Lord never lets an opportunity pass on something like that where he doesn't instruct them. Verse 7. He says this, and uh, for you have the poor with you always, and whatso and whensoever you ye will do do them good, but but ye have not, but me ye have not always. 
He says the poor, you know, that's, in, that's in, we always have the poor. There's never going to be a, a non-poor class of people. And by the way, being poor doesn't mean people aren't happy. Uh, people, there, are a lot, there are a lot of people in the world that are much happier than us that have just about everything we want anytime we want it. They're very content with, with what they have. And that makes them happy when you're really content with, with what you have. And so uh, he says the poor, is, and he says, you, you, you know, you, there's nothing wrong with doing good to the, for the poor. He says, but you're not, not going to always have me. You need to focus on me. Uh, I'm not going to be with you. He, he's told them a lot of things that have not, they, it just hasn't sunk in. And so it seems that the Lord softens his rebuke a little bit by, t by telling them that uh, what they wanted to do was good and, and, that, and that as they had opportunity, they should help the poor who should always be part of any economy. But he goes on to say that there's a higher good being done by this woman, and this was her only opportunity to do it. Why? Well, because, he says, but me ye have not always, speaking in the physical sense. I mean, we always have them in the spiritual sense, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, which is what right here now, there he is in the midst. And uh, he said, in the spirit, because in just a few days, the Lord would go to Calvary, the cross. But in the more important spiritual sense and in the, in the eternity to come, Hebrews 13, 5b tells us this, for he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So he's, you know, he, he's, for the true believer, he, he never is, he's always there for him. In Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, amen. So in one scripture right here, he's telling them, I'm not going to be with you for very long. And then in another scripture a little later on, he tells them, I'm going to be with you always. <laughs> so it sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. As we know, it's just a different understanding. Verse 8, she had done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the burings. <laughs> he's talking about his death. The disciples really didn't want to hear that. They, didn't, you know, they just didn't want to hear that. But uh, she did what she could. All we need to do, it, it, we all need to do what we can for the Lord. Uh, he has, he, she has come aforehand to anoint his body to the, to the burying. In Matthew 26, verse 12, For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. So he has the body, it's on the feet too. So started on the head and feet. Remember when... Down to the feet. Well, remember when, uh, when Aaron was anointed the high priest? You know, they poured the ointment uh, yeah, down his beard, yeah, it, all the way down. And so uh, it says, in anticipation of the event and with the belief that she would not have opportunity after the death. I believe that's why she anointed them. There, she therefore does what she can. It would be, jo who, would, who, would, who would actually take the, the body after the Lord's death? It would be Jer uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Uh, the, uh, Joseph would go to Pilate and be he actually begged for the body. Uh, it wasn't like you could just walk by uh, the cross and take down anybody you wanted to bury him. I mean, uh, they were guarded even then. And so he, it would be Joseph of Arimathea who would plead with Pilate for the body and then bury the Lord in his tomb with the help of Nicodemus and probably some servants that are not, not named. Nine, uh, verse 9, Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. So she's going to be remembered for all times for what she has done. Something good. Now, Judas Iscariot is remembered for all times for something he did which was bad. Fairly, and so this is also, she had done, spoke, it's, it's going to be mentioned, what, two thousand, almost 2,000 years now. The fact that it is recorded here for our reading and understanding is proof of the fulfillment of what the Lord said. And so, verse 10, And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. So, very, very quickly, the scene changes, and Judas disappears. Uh, how, how much 
how much time is between verse 9 and 10, we're not told. Judas had been rebuked by the Lord publicly. A public sin, uh, public sin requires public rebuke. Sometimes people do outrageous things in public, and then behind closed doors, somebody says, shame on you. Well, you know, <laughs> you can take a lot of shame on you behind closed doors, but in public, uh, it, it, you know, it hurts. And so a public, it was a public rebuke for a public, uh, for something. And of course, the Lord knew, D Daisy, if you don't get down. <laughs> She's making up for lost time. Last week, she was good. And so Judas, having been rebuked along with those supported, who supported his objection, and it may have been the fuse that lit the fire of betrayal. I mean, that may have been the last straw for Judas. He, he had, had it in his heart to do it. Now, being publicly shamed or rebuked, he, he takes off. Here, it's an interesting point for me that he was one of the 12 disciples for a long period of time. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm Yeah. And he was chosen. Was he always bad or was he good? I mean, he just he was happened to draw the wrong straw. He was devil possessed. Remember the well, Lord said Yeah, the Lord the Lord says and I don't know the scripture we had about well, he, maybe that was after he was chosen to be the one that would turn him. No, the Lord says I, 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 you have now chosen me, I have chosen you, and one of you is a devil. So the Lord, when, he, when Judas was chosen to be one of the 12 disciples, I believe he was already demon-possessed. Which shows you how subtle demon possession can be because the other disciples had no clue. But the Lord knew exactly who it was. And he knew all the things, all, you know, he knew. So, you know, it's, that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, you know, was he demon possessed before? You know, I don't know. When as a child, I don't know. Uh, so he had been for thousands. Here again, we have this. Uh, yeah, where am I here? Verse ten. Yes. Okay. And Judas had been rebuked along with those that supported his objection, and it may have been the fuse that lit the fire. Here also we have an evil memorial, right? We talked about the good memorial for, for Mary for the anointing, and now G Judas for 2,000 years has been, he's, he's been remembered. For thousands of years, the name Judas has been a symbol of evil. You don't normally name your, your sons Judas. Although, you know, some, I'm sure some parents have done that. It's a symbol of evil and betrayal. Mary's use of the ointment and the Lord's rebuke was more than, really, more than he could bear. He's, he's, he's praising her. He's, he's rebuking him. And, I mean, it, all in public, it, it was too much. In John chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So it's just, again, he's speaking up. He's, he's really mad about that money. And First Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Did Judas love money? I mean, he loved money. And so verse 11, and when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And, uh, and he sought how he might be conveniently betray him. So he went, goes to the chief priests and, uh, to betray him. And when, the, and when he comes, they're happy about that. Now they got somebody on the inside willing to betray the Lord. Uh, when they say betray him, point him out, well, it turns out to be that. But Judas had to give them more information than that. Judas had to give them the, the Lord's the, kind of the itinerary, what was kind of how things really worked. Go to the temple, down from the temple, maybe over to someone's house to eat, then maybe into the Garden of Gethsemane for prayer, because because that's where the betrayal would take place, and so Judas had to give them that that information, I think, in advance, and so they would know where to come and, and at what time to do it. And they heard it; they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. So this is where he's figuring out, you know, the Lord's itinerary, and so he can give it to them. 
They they were glad. They had an inside man, and Judas he was no re, he, he was no religious zealot either. He he just he was just wanted money. So he wasn't betraying the Lord because he didn't believe in what the Lord was teaching. He was betraying the Lord because of money. And so uh, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. The Lord did not stand out physically in a crowd. He was a plain-looking Jew. Notice that Judas sought a convenient time to betray. He would look for a time when there was the fewest followers present. Being night would also cloak the betrayal. People just love to do evil at night, nighttime. And then we have uh, verses uh, 12 through 16. So, this, so we know that the plot has been set, and now the the scene changes again, and we get to the point of, 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 the, of the communion. Verse 12, And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sent forth two of his disciples, and said unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a young man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, Master, the master saith, Where is the guest chamber? And I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city, and found it as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. So the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, this... Uh, he gives the disciples some direction. So now we go back to the, the Edis, uh, to uh, Exodus, where the Passover is, is instituted. It, it's part of the, the, the Jews coming out of Egypt from by the Lord. And he shall take a bunch of hyssop, uh, Exodus, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lentils and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of this house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to, to smite you. And, you know, and so, you know, the, 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 the application of the blood to the doors of the home kept the people safe from, from the, the the destroying angel that would pass through the land of Egypt and kill the firstborn of, of not only of, of the people, but of, of the animals as well. And so uh, that's, that's the, uh, the picture. And of course, we talk about the, the Lamb of God who was shed for the, uh, the atonement of our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have to apply the blood, not by sprinkling it on you, but by receiving him and his shed blood as pay full payment for our sin. Nothing added, nothing taken away. And so he uh, sends forth two of his disciples and uh, to meet a fellow bearing a, pr a pitcher of water. So I suspect there were not a lot of people walking around. I think they buried the water on their heads oftentimes. They carried those things. I've seen some pictures of people put stuff up on their heads. I mean, we're talking, we're talking heavy weight. I mean, really heavy weight. I mean, bales of stuff. And they just walk along with the hand up and, you know, greeting people along the way. Uh, and so, uh, the, and so, let's see, where am I? Okay. And so he t tells them to go and f follow the man to the guest chamber where you see the Passover with my disciples and he will show you a large upper room. Now, I, I, I marked that large upper room because there are eight of us in this room. So we had four more people. If, if, if Wilma was here and Gary was here, that'd be 10. And we're not sitting, we could sit in the middle of this, we could get a dozen people sitting in the middle, very easily get a double people. I think the room that, that's being spoken of here is much larger than this room. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, you could, I think we could, if there was no furniture here, I mean, you take all the furniture out, and you, I think you've got plenty of room to do that. So, uh, 
It says, he, you know, he's asking for a large upper room. And, I, and, and the word large is there for a reason. I think, I think more people ate, ate the uh, Passover with the Lord than just the 12. Daisy, go lay down. You're going in your kettle. Get in there. Go on. Get, get in there. Get in. Thank you. I said, I'm not staying. Uh, yeah, so you need to go to Acts tw uh, 1, 21 and 22. Uh, in Luke 22, verse 8, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover that we may eat. There is another supper yet future prepared and hosted by the Lamb, and that's of God, and that's in Revelation 19.9. And uh, I hope to, everyone here in this room is at that supper, because in Revelation 19.9, and he saith to me, Right, blessed are they which are called to what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where the church uh, uh, meets the Lord uh, in the air and in heaven. There's a, a marriage supper. Don't, and we don't have details about it's not in a lot. Heaven's a lot bigger than a large upper room. So, and in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. So the Lord's with, the, with his inner circle. Matthew 26, 20 says, Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, where there are also other disciples, whether, and then the question is, were there other disciples already in that large upper room? And let's see how we go here. Verse 18, And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me, shall betray me. Now, this is where I start to think that there's more people there because he says, those that eat it to me. So there would be a circle of 12, the other circle. With the, actually, be 13 people there. The Lord would be the 13th person. But he makes specific reference to the ones that are eating with him because they would eat off a common, off a common di thing in the front. They would all eat off a common thing, take bread and dip it and stuff like that. So, okay, just let me read on. And so, uh, in verse 19, And they began to be sorrowful and say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? So he's, he's telling them that one of them that are eating with him are going to betray him. So it's going to be one of the twelve. And so uh, 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 they would begin to, and they began to be sorrowful. Eleven would be grieved at the thought of betraying the Messiah. <laughs> Uh, Judas Iscariot would not. He he was, but he would he would also claim ignorance. Of course, he's not going to make a public confession there. And so, and they said unto him, "One, is it I?" You know, they are so confused at this point in time, and so, I mean, I would be too. I mean, I I don't. I mean, they've been taught a lot. They've they've heard a lot. They've heard things they don't understand. As being Jews, they're looking for the return of, the, of, a, of a kingdom, a, a earthly kingdom. They're looking for a, a, uh, someone to come in and deal with the, the oppression and the, all the things that are going on. And the Lord's talking about different things here to them. And it's not, all, it, it does, it's not fitting at all you know, for them. Uh, I had courses in college that were like that, and I, through the whole course, nothing ever fit. I didn't get a good mark, you know. It, I just never could fit it together. And so, uh, and so the uh, and he answered and said unto you, one of the twelve dippeth with, that dippeth with me in the dish. So here again, it's it's the common table, the common the common dish that that's being dealt with here with with the twelve. And so. Uh, it is one of the twelve. In Psalm 41, a thousand years prior to that, yea, my own familiar friend, whom I trusted, and, and which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That's, that's a prophecy of, of, of Judas uh, betraying the Lord that was given in the Psalms probably nearly a thousand years before, before it happened. Because many of the Psalms were written in the time of David. David reigned a thousand BC. So we're now we're 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 way way past that. Why why say it is one of the twelve if only the twelve are present? Here 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 again. They're in the room, and the Lord says unto them, He says, "It is one of the twelve. Ah. 
And he answered and said, it is one of the twelve that dippeth with me. Why would he say that? Why would he point out it is the twelve? I mean, I would, when I would talk about you, I wouldn't talk about as one of the, one of the seven that are in the room with me, implying that maybe there are other people there too, you know. So here again, he's pointing to the particular group eating with him. Okay, like I said, this was uh, verse 21. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. And so we see in this verse the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Two biblical truths that seem to be contradictory within the bounds of human thought, but taught in Scripture. This is all part of God's plan, and yet Judas is responsible for what he's doing. Sometimes we don't understand that. You know, God puts us through trials. God brings things into our life that we would prefer they don't come in. And then, then we, you know, and so, uh, and we've all been there. We've all had major, major things in our life happen that we would not want to happen to anybody. And so, uh, two biblical, biblical truths here bound up in Scripture. John 6, 64, but there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. He knew right from the very beginning. He knew that when he chose Judas, that Judas would be the one to betray him. In John chapter 6, verse 70, Jesus answered, have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? So Jesus knew, knew all this along, all part of God's plan. Verse 22, and following. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it unto them and they drank all of it. And, and he said unto them, This is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So, okay, this is the institute, institution of what we call the Eucharist or the communion or Lord's table or the Lord's supper, whatever you want to call it. This is, this is the event that we use to, to do different times. Some people do it every, some churches do it every day, some do it every week, some do it once a year, some do it every once a month. Now, our church does it once a month. Uh, in, uh, after the evening service on a Sunday, on a, on a given Sunday. Now, what I gave you, uh, I, I don't know what good time, I gave you this little handout just to go through. And what I did was I went through and I looked in, in the Bible for all the verses that had the word eat and blood in them. Okay. So the first, very first verse comes in Genesis. But the flesh... Uh, with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye, what, not eat. For Exodus, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two posts and on the upper door wherein of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So that's, that's just the blood on the door, but then they're talk, the, the eating is talking about the lamb inside. It will be a perpetual statute for your generations through all your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. Uh, Levit Leviticus 7.26 Moreover you, sh you shall eat no manner of blood. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger that sojourned among you eat blood. For it is the life of the flesh, the blood is for, is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of, the, of all flesh is the blood whereof whosoever eateth shall be cut off. Leviticus, ye shall not eat anything with blood. Okay, I'm not going to read all through. You get the point? Now there's a couple of things in here that talks about... Uh, the fowls of the air eating the blood of the dead bodies on a field of thing. Who, who, who wrote, who, whose scripture, where, where did these scriptures come from? Holy men of God penned them as they were moved by what? The Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit of Christ. You know, in a sense, Christ wrote this. 
So he's not going to contradict himself. He is not going to contradict himself. And so uh, he goes on and he, he, he's take, he's, he, they're eating the meal. Uh, they've got uh, wine or grape juice, however you want to do it. They've got the fruit. Of, it's identified as the fruit of the vine. When you squeeze a gra grape, you get grape juice. It, when you let the grape juice sit around for a fair amount of time, you're going to get, you're going to get fermentation. You're going to get some alcohol in it. Okay. Uh, you know, you want to have a glass of wine, have a glass of wine. That's your business, you know. At our church, we use grape juice. We don't use wine. We don't use fermented. We don't use anything fermented. Uh, the, Jews, the Jews don't eat blood. But the English, they, they have blood pudding. I mean, they, they are, uh, so people have totally lost what, what the Lord has commanded here with regard to eating blood. I don't like my meat rare. I like my meat well done, you know. So even my hamburgers, they get a little dry. They like hockey pucks every so often, but that's the way. So I'm just I'm just reading it, you know, for you to show you where we're going here. I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in new in the kingdom of God. Then in Luke's account, 22, verse 15 to 20. And he will say unto them, With desire I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in, the, fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and, th and gave thanks and break it and said unto them, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after the supper. This is the cup. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. In Matthew 26, verse 26 to 29, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it unto them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of, the, of this fruit of the vine. He, talking about drinking the same thing that they were drinking. He says here, For I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So there's, kind of, you know, I don't understand, you know, we have so little understanding of what heaven is like, you know, is there going to be floors and walls and trees and, you know, I don't know. And so we just know it's going to be great. And so, uh, okay, so I get down. So a foundation, a foundation for understanding these verses lies in Genesis 4. Uh, but with the flesh, but but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So that's the first place where the Lord's guidance is: you don't eat the you don't eat the blood, you do not eat the blood. Then you get to John. We go to John chapter six, verses twenty-three through sixty-three. Now I'm not going to read forty verses here, but I've put some ellipsis dots in there to for for part of the scriptures that I thought we could not lose the meaning thereof but you just not read so you can go back and read with your bible the, the whole thing howbeit there came other boats okay so he's now on going somewhere and the lord is coming ashore and there's some other boats come from Tiberias uh, to, to a place where they did eat bread now this is not a communion this is not a, uh, a memorial type setting and after the Lord had given thanks, when the people therefore saw Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they took also shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, he, they said unto him, and I was talking to him, then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might, might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he had sent me, they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? 
and what and what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. Okay, so this is a situation where the Lord has come ashore. The, he's uh, at a place. The people have gathered around. And now there are religious people, Jews, that are asking him what they may do. It says, uh, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Their mindset is, I've got to do, so. what do you want me to do? Do you want me to dig a ditch? Do you want me to break a rock? Do you want me to paint a picture? You know, what, tell me what you want to do. And he tells them, it's not about that kind of doing. It's about faith. It's about believing. And he said, what? And they wanted a sign. He tells them, it says here, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he had sent. That's uh, should have underlined it so you know, but it's there towards the bottom third in that text there. He's telling them, believe. I, I don't want you to do stuff. I want you to believe. Okay? And then they're not, set, this just, they're not satisfied. So what did they ask for him? Then they said, therefore, unto him, what sign show us us that? They, they wanted us to do something, you know? Do a backflip or, uh, you know, t turn, you know, you know, do something that's exciting here, here. They always wanted to see something physical. And so, and so what sign, and, and so, uh, then, uh, and then they said, they, they said, therefore unto him, what sign show us then, that we may be, see and believe what thou doest the work. Then they said to this, our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread for our, equal that was the, a sign for them the man in the morning every morning the little little white things out on the, the grass it was physical everything about the jew was material their, their their focus their desire was the land it was all material the, the their their, uh, their their religious practices was bringing a, a, an animal to uh a, a sacrifice to, to give something or to or to do something it was all every all their 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 uh, focus was material their blessing was material what what are the jews waiting for now the they're waiting to get back into the land that's not for, that's not for christians we haven't been promised any land not so much as a, not even the place that we're sitting on the, the Jews were focused on material things. And the, Lord, the Lord's trying to turn their thought. He says, just believe. And they said, oh, show us a sign. It, right back to the material. As soon as you believe, right back to the material. And so now they give them an example of material. Look, at Moses gave us, maybe gave us manna. Well, Moses didn't give it. <laughs> Moses had no ability to create, create, do create anything like that. Okay, so... Then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Don't get, you know, they, <laughs> and so he's, he's not, he says, uh, Moses didn't give you that bread. But my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He, he doesn't complete, he, he does he says, Moses didn't give it to you, implying that God did. But he said, my, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. I got a different bread for you. And it's spiritual bread. It's not physical bread. He's trying to turn, it's, phys, it's spiritual bread. It's not physical bread. For the, for the bread of God is, is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the bread of life. And we're not going to slice them up and eat them like a loaf of rye bread the, but the Jews had that mentality and then said they unto him Lord get, okay so they want the bread okay he says and I you just know for the Jews they're thinking the bread he's, he's going to give not going to give us the manna he's going to give us something maybe a little tastier you know maybe something that uh, you know so they're waiting to see that then they said unto him Lord Evermore, give us this bread. Then, they, So they asked for the bread. Well, they're going to get it. Let's see if they like it. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, 
and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I don't want to be, you get the whole loaf. You know, you don't get a slice, of, you get, you get, what do you get when you trust the, the Lord as your Savior? You get the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, indw God indwelling in me. I don't understand how that works, but you get the whole loaf. And, uh, and a fountain of living water. <laughs> Isn't that what the, when he, the lady at the well said, trust in me? And you get the, so we got the water and we got the, the bread in us in a, in a, in a, in a, in a spiritual sense. But the Jews didn't get it. I mean, they just didn't get it. Here we go. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which cometh down from heaven. They're thinking, they're thinking cannibalism here. I mean, and they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. And then he goes on, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of my, this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the light of the world. He had to die. He had to give us, he had to die for the indwelling Holy Spirit to come and indwell the believer. You remember he telling the disciples, I'm, am I, uh, eight minutes ago, he's telling the disciples uh, uh, later on, I got to go away. Uh, let not your heart be troubled. You know, he's telling them, I got to go away and the comfort is going to come, but he can't come until I go. And the comfort it was the, the, the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so, uh, but, but they, they just didn't have it. The Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I mean, you see, they, ju they just couldn't get away from, from the, the manna and the physical bread. They just they couldn't make the transition. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Okay, now he's really pouring on the, the, the coals here. Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And uh, whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. It's spiritual. We have all of the uh, all of, the, of God dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit. But you have to receive it. We're cloaked with the righteousness of Christ. And as the living Father had sent me, I live by the Father. So that he, so he that eateth me, even he shall shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna. He's trying to explain to them it's not physical, and are dead. He that eateth the bread shall live forever. We have everlasting life when you trust Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. When you receive him by faith and faith alone. Eternal life, not material life, not life on this earth, but eternal life. These things said he in the synagogue. See, he was in the Jews' place, in the Jews' house, in the synagogue. And I mean, this was going over like a lead balloon for them. They were just... Uh, and so uh, he says, as the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father, so that he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who could hear it? Then when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does, does this offend you? And uh, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? The, the Jews, unfortunately for them, bless their hearts. The Jews are thinking physical as they, as they were a physical body. The Jews are a physical body. When Israel is restored to, in the land, it's a group, a specific group of physical people restored in a physical place, the group of land. For the Christian, uh, our body is, the body of Christ is a spiritual body. 
And we have a spiritual home. We're, we don't, we're not given an ounce of land on this earth like the Jews. So it's, it's, it's totally different. And so it, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. He tells them this is spiritual. And they are life. You know, so first of all, you know, then I go on. First of all, we see that the Lord is the bread of life, and it is the spiritual realm that is in view here. It was unbelieving Jews that thought he was talking about being the physical bread, and that they could they could not understand, and thus they could not accept his teaching on the matter. Moving to the text in view, we see the parallel passage that the Lord was creating a memorial. This is why I get back to communion. He's creating a memorial. Something to be remembered on a regular basis. He says in Luke, do this in remembrance of me. Notice in Mark's account that the disciples drank first from the cup and then the Lord told them that it was symbolic of his blood. Going to address it again as the fruit of the vine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26, for I, this is Paul teaching the Corinthians the memorial. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he gave thanks he brake it and said unto them, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death till he come. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. I believe that it was probably a, uh, probably a hymn of one of the Psalms, because the Psalms were basically sung, and not, we don't sing them today, but they were basically sung by the Jews because in the Hebrew language, they sound a lot better than they do in the English translation. And so uh, I believe at this point, the, the disciples didn't fully understand that the Lord's death was a planned part of his earthly ministry. I, I, they, they just didn't understand that. And that his, the spiritual kingdom he was gathering was greater than the material kingdom for David that they hoped to be restored. So, you know, these are, these, are Jewish, these are going to be Jewish Christians. The Jewish Christians, so, you know, the, being, being Jewish at some point in history, future, being a Jew will be very good because they'll be in the land. They'll be protected by the Lord. Uh, they, they, will, they, will be, they will be back in the land, all of them. They, they're going to live long, long lives. But it's much better to be a Christian <laughs> and a Christian Jew because then you have eternal life, not as a Jew, but as a Christian, because it's, it's eternal life. So uh, they, they, they have confused thinking. It's like trying to unteach something. They were Jews, and they were taught for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years certain things. And now, in a three-year period, these group of disciples, not just the twelve, but the other disciples that were with him, and there were at least 120 or more of them uh, that followed around with women and children. Uh, I don't know how all that logistics was done. Uh, but the, they, uh, they were, it was going to take a while for them to make the transition. Remember, after P Pentecost and the 40, year, 40 days that the Lord was on the earth and then the ascension, uh, the Jews didn't go anywhere. Peter, Paul, uh, Peter, and Mark, and, Math, and Matthew, and uh, not Mark, Peter and Matthew, and all the the, the, the twelve, eleven disciples. They didn't go, and they stayed in Jerusalem. It really wasn't until, and because Paul was out hunting them down at, at some point, as 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 Saul the, the the Pharisee, and then on the road to Damascus, when in Acts, when when the Lord dropped Paul in his tracks and said, you know, enough of, enough of this, you're going to be my disciple or my apostle and you're going to go to the Gentiles. And so Paul was the one that spread, spread the gospel to, to most of the Gentile nations at that point in time. 
And Peter was told, you're, you're going to be an apostle to the Jews. The Jews were so much harder to convert than the pagan Gentiles. They just couldn't get the Jewishness. They couldn't get it out of them. And so anyway, that's, uh, that's where we are. And we made it all the way through. Uh, you know, uh, I, hope, I hope there was something in there, some enlightenment. Uh, so, any questions? All right, let's ask God's blessing as we leave. Father, thank you again for this time and your word. Uh, strong meat, sometimes hard to understand. Uh, but Lord, uh, if we uh, trust in you and, and lean on you for understanding and spend time in prayer, time in reading your word, you will reveal, reveal your truth to us each in individually. We thank you for those that are here. Again, uh, be with Wilma and the procedure today. Pray that that goes well. We ask, ask for a good outcome. And Lord, we hope to meet again next Wednesday uh, according to your will, thanking you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.